on Sound As Ever right now. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome Jamie Hutchings. Uh, most of us know him from Blue Bottle Kiss and Solo, of course, um, and Blue Bottle Kiss are about to head out on the road. Jamie, it's probably we've worked out about 20 years since we actually saw each other in the flesh. I think that was when you and Ben Fletcher were um, were kind of hightailing it around the UK at, uh, uh, quite some time ago. It wasn't Blue Bottle Kiss related, was it? It or was, was yeah. yeah, it was. We just didn't have enough money to take the full band, so we, um, so Millie, our manager, ended up booking us a tour with just the two of us, sort of just playing songs with acoustic and electric guitar through, through England. I um I remember seeing you on that 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 last time twenty years ago, which just sounds ridiculous. Um, but you gave me a whole heap of the records that I'd missed out on since living in England. I, I remember you, you were like, we've released so many records since since the 90s. Here, have, 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 have like all our recent albums. And I'll never forget the last show I ever did on BBC Six Music um, when it was, you know, my contract hadn't got renewed and I was gutted, but, you know, it was for the best. But the first song I played as my final show on the BBC was Everything Begins and Ends at exactly the right time. Oh, nice one. So that 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 song is quite special to me because that kind of signified <laughs> not the beginning and the end. Like that was my that was saying goodbye to my London, like my British career. And I, yeah. I came back to Australia soon after. Um so so there you go. I just wanted to share that special memory with you. Yeah. Oh, that's great. It's a line that line is stolen from Picnic at Hanging Rock. It's like Miranda says it, I think, just before those three girls disappear. Oh gosh. <laughs> You're back on the road. How does it feel? Because you know, you guys have kind of it it's been juxtapositions almost, I, I think it's fair to say, because you've been you've been concentrating on all your solo stuff. Um, what does this tour? represent to you this upcoming tour that kicks off next week honestly it's it's uh i don't know that it represents anything it's just it's actually just a real pleasure to get into the room with the guys again and and hang out with them like fletch and i have kept in contact and groundsy and i have always been pretty close but like i hadn't seen i ran into rich at a gig a few years ago I've hardly seen him at all over the past 20 years so um yeah and we've only had because Grancy lives in Melbourne um and the rest of us are in Sydney uh we've only had we had one weekend of rehearsals a few months ago and that's been it and oh. yeah Richo brought all this um all these fine sort of cheeses and meats and, and beer and all this stuff and then and then on the Saturday night our friends Scream Feeder were playing were playing and 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 they'd invited us to the show. So I think all of us went to the show. So, so it's really, to be honest, it's um, as much as Blue Bottle makes, the music's quite substantial, you know, it's not a light kind of listen to the band, mm. but really it's, it's just fun, really kind of really, really fun just to um, spend time and, and also revisiting all the songs. Everyone had really done their homework and we really enjoyed playing them together. And I mean, they should be wanting to do it for a while, but I, I was fairly insistent that we maybe have a re-release on vinyl of, of, of something. So it's a good opportunity to revisit um, that and get like Patient, which is the one album that we own the rights to, to get, do a really good mastering job because it was we had very little money when we did that album, and it was really it was really difficult sort of getting it. You know, we'd been on a major label where we sort of had the budgets and stuff and so it was difficult to get it really sounding good so it's really nice also to remaster it and get a really good pressing done so that's another part of the whole thing as well so yeah you mentioned um the only record you had the rights to so at, just in a nutshell I mean you don't have to go into detail but what what were the complexities of not owning the rest of your back catalogue it's owned by the record company I might assume yeah, the early releases are all we were on a an imprint of Sony Music, and so they funded all those recordings and therefore own the rights right. to the actual recordings. And uh, can you buy them back at all? 
it's prohibitively expensive. Like um, there's Somnambulous Homesick Blues, which was a mini album that came out in 97. There's a label in Perth called Lover's Fiction who have re-released that. But for them to do it was so, like, they asked they asked me about doing re-releasing stuff. And I said, if you want to do this, the Murmur stuff, like, go for your life. Because I'd, I'd looked into that and it's, yeah, it's pretty much impossible, which is why a lot of, major label like there's a lot of alternative bands that were part of the that got signed to those sub labels in the 90s mm, and mm. just to license they make it very for them it's not worth it's too much of a hassle to re-release it themselves so they're like oh yeah you want to do it sure but it's going to cost this mm. you know so you end up having to charge people like 70 dollars oh i don't know an album or something it's just yeah it's pretty Im- impossible like i certainly would never attempt to do it on my label with any of those old, old, older releases. Yeah, right. Uh, did um, did having that jam with the other guys, uh, did it bring back the muscle memory from playing those songs? Yeah. I mean, because we started talking about it before COVID and then COVID here and Fletcher was in America so there's a lot of time. So I think everyone did their homework, but for me it was difficult because a lot of the a lot of them are in in alternate tunings, and I'd lost a lot of the tunings, and I had to literally go on YouTube and watch myself and you know freeze these pixelated sort of live <laughs> videos and look at the shapes and where my capo was and stuff. That was actually quite quite hard, but by the time we got together, it was really easy we did like one run through and about 70% of the songs we pretty much played like we used to play them before. What did you think when you had to look at yourself on YouTube? Again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was concentrating on my hands, not my face. So it's all right. <laughs> How, given the time period that the members of the band, you know, covered, covered I mean, and, and, and the back, your back, your vast BBK back catalogue, how have you decided what material you're going to um you're going to play live on this particular tour? Well, there was a lot of different lineups in Blue Bottle, actually. So we went through I don't know how many lineups. Mm. So, so first of all, as Fletch and I kind of started talking, and then it was like, where do we go from there? Because we had quite a lot of drummers, and Richo hadn't played drums for years, but he's a fantastic drummer. Was then, and since he's been playing again, he is years now so it was that and Fletch didn't really want to play bass anymore like he did on patient on the earlier recording so it made sense for us to do it as a quartet with Groundsy who was in the band as the bassist and then moved to guitar after Fletch left so that's so that lineup basically we're playing songs from the period that that lineup existed so that lineup did play a little bit of earlier stuff and we're pretty much playing up to about Revenge is slow and then after Rich I left there's so much material just from that period that it's mm. like, so there's a lot of stuff we're not playing because the guys would have to be learning parts that they didn't actually play. So it seems to make sense to for them, for everyone to be, you know, obviously for me it's different, but for them to play stuff that they that they originally contributed to. Mm. How do you feel about your old band looking back now and what you did back in the 90s? Uh, you know, sometimes I hear stuff and I cringe a bit, but... Why do most... you cringe? Why do you cringe, Jamie? Oh, you know, just being young, kind of the lyrics, <laughs> the lines you'd write or just the way you'd sing them or something. But I don't, by and large, I don't feel ashamed by by, by most, of it, most of it. The intention of the band from during the whole period was always... Integrity was a really big part of the the band we always wanted to do something that our hearts were really in rather than taking any shortcuts and I guess we may have suffered as a result of that but the good side of it is that 20 years on it's not like oh do we have to play that song that's so so embarrassing you know most of it most of it uh we all really like and it's really it's really sweet given that I'm the stronger that the other guys like them as much as me um like it wasn't always an easy band to be in. I wasn't always an easy band person to be in a band with being kind of often having quite strong ideas, but everybody is a fan of the band. So it's really lovely that everybody actually looks back and really enjoys 
the music and that was really apparent straight away that everyone was really enjoying playing the song so that's a really lovely feeling just that they've got their sentiments that are attached to the band are all overwhelmingly positive yeah yeah there's a lot of love I mean it's showing in the fact that you know a lot of the Sound as Ever members are so excited about about Blue Bottle Kisses return um Take me back to early 90s Sydney and um, being that young, I guess, um, young, excited songwriter that wanted to form this integral band. 1993 you formed with Ben, um, influenced, I guess, in a way by what was going on on college radio in, in, in the States, Um can you can you take me back to 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 that time? What you remember? Like how was the scene? How you you know forming the band? Those first gigs? Yeah, well, we were real outsiders when the first when the first lineup of the band started. I didn't know anybody. I was a punter that would just a young punter that would go and see bands, and I guess had been going to see bands since I was a teenager. And they see it seemed like this very exotic world that I wasn't part of so to and then it was we had a different Fletch joined about well, maybe eight months after the band first started so we had another lineup before and the other two oh, were, okay the other two guys were quite I don't I don't know that they even really liked the music that we were playing but we seemed to gain a bit of traction when we did a cassette and their friends heard it and they liked it and so they started circulating the cassette and giving it to people I didn't really do anything myself it sort of just started happening and it was quite I was really nerve nervous about it because it was a world that I I didn't know anyone in bands or anything like that so to suddenly be in it and be a part of it and I mean I have a very early memory of Tim Rogers being at a show a midweek show where we were must have been playing with one of his friends bands and after the show him coming up and um introducing himself and just saying how much he loved it and blah 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 and that was like a What's going? You know, like to go to have somebody give you a compliment from a band that who you would be going to see as a punter and start that that little world start moving and you're meeting different people from bands you really looked up to because I mean in the eighties for instance as a teenager like Australian independent bands to me I probably knew more Australian independent bands than American independent bands so they were huge to me they were like rock stars bands that. Um, Bands like the Celebrate Rifles, or um, you know, I started. I went left school early and went to art school in about sixteen, and all the older kids were listening to the Laughing Clowns and stuff like that. And so all that kind of thing. It was those bands were were as big as probably Sonic Youth or Dinosaur Junior. Those bands were to me like it. So to be in that music scene was quite a, a big jump, you know, being on the other side of the of the of the of the mirror or whatever you it's like the you know the Alice in Wonderland thing like you know you're looking at something and suddenly you're inside that world it's quite quite that quite exciting and and nerve-wracking I guess. <laughs> Can you take me through what it was like uh being part of that murmur family because there was ammonia there was silver chair there was something for Kate there was yourselves um I mean, they 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 did really well in the '90s, and they seemed to really handpick the artists that they had on the label. Was it? I mean, looking back, was it a family kind of vibe or a really cool vibe there, or were you kind of left to your own devices? Because you talk about being an outsider band. What what was that whole label experience like at the time? Um, the head of the label, John O'Donnell, was really lovely and still is a very lovely person. And the reason we signed to the label was basically because of him, because we had a few other labels that sort of had us on hold and were interested. And they all had that, I don't know, a lot of them had that 90s aloof music industry vibe. And John was a real dag, you know, <laughs> he was a family man who liked cold chisel and stuff. And I, I wasn't in, I didn't feel intimidated by him. So, so that was always very comfortable dealing with him. In terms of the other bands and stuff, I remember Sarah Longhurst, who managed a lot of bands at the time, like Custard and Pollyanna and Big Heavy Stuff, and she didn't manage us, but she 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 used to help us when she could, and she used to always describe us as the red-headed stepchildren of the label. 
I think that's a pretty accurate description. Like, um, I don't think we were as accessible as accessible as as the other bands. And we did a very big tour with Jebediah and Something for Kate in 1996 called the Uni Palooza Tour, where we did this grueling tour for six weeks through all the unis. And both those bands were just starting out, but it was really obvious just the they gained traction so quickly and we'd already put out a couple of albums and there was just an obvious kind of understanding between most audiences and those two bands. There was just an immediacy. It, always, it took us years to get a following. So it was different, but, um, but, you know, there was a good, we had a very good relationship with something for Kate in the early days, uh, both bands, I guess that out of all the bands in the label, they were the band, I mm. think, closest to um yeah I'd agree with that yeah musically yeah. too yeah yeah I think early on um I think we probably both went in different mm. directions but uh yeah we became really good friends with with them and Paul uh, Paul filled in on us for, for drums on a tour and a drummer left and I contributed to one of his early solo records scared of horses so there was a friendship there probably for a couple of years and then they just kind of like hit the roof and I haven't really um haven't really been in contact with them since, but yeah, they're probably the only, the only band that we play with regularly. We used to swap around, you know, doing shows quite regularly for about two years, but all of the bands were not, I mean, the silver chair kids were very good to us early on. Um, they seemed to really like, I remember Daniel seemed to really like blue bottle kiss and they used to give us the biggest audience we would, we would play to were their audiences who would have mixed responses to us, but it was always fun to play, you know, in on decent stages with good PAs and stuff supporting them. That's yeah, that they, I mean their journey was remarkable too. I mean watching that for you must have been pretty crazy because you talk about Jebediah certainly and 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 um Pollyanna absolutely but the silver chair thing was a different kettle of fish altogether. It that was just crazy. Mm. And they were just really sweet kids from Newcastle, just this chair and face teenagers from Newcastle their parents who come to the shows and we meet their parents and the the sweet thing about those three guys is they were they reminded me of me when I was 15 I was <laughs> like they'd be side of the stage you know they'd be headlining selling out you know to a thousand people or more but they would be side of the stage watching the support bands they'd be watching a band like Midget or or us or whatever and um and loving it because they're discovering and absorbing all this music but at the same time, they're 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 sort of in two places at once, absorbing and, in a sense, being educated by what they were seeing. Um, but also at the top of their game commercially. So, it's, yeah, interesting kind of journey for those guys for sure. Higher up the fire trails is such. I mean, apart from being your debut album, it was such a landmark album. Anyway, you got Wayne Connolly on board for that one. Uh, did you were you pretty studio savvy at that point, or was that something you you kind of learnt as you kept recording records? Yeah, I wasn't studio savvy personally. I'd done a lot of four tracking. I was a really big home recorder, um, and all the early Blue Bottle Kiss, like we released a cassette before Murmur signed us, and that was all done on four tracks. So my main experience, and the other guys as well. We'd done a bit of stuff, demos and stuff, but it had mostly been recording on cassettes in lounge rooms and stuff. And the recording studio personally didn't really appeal to me at the time. I loved the sound of open spaces um, in recordings when I'd hear them, which is why we asked if we could do it somewhere other than a recording studio. So Wayne and I kind of, and the budget was quite small in that record. So Wayne and I just sort of, I can't remember how we found out that the Bono Pavilion Theatre was was free well maybe we just walked in there they were doing like renovations and it was closed and they said you can have it for a hundred dollars a day so they like, right. it's a beautiful little um theater i haven't you know and um yeah they let us use it for four days and um we hired a yeah way and organized hiring a tape machine from a local studio and that was our first experience so the first experience recording a record was quite unorthodox because we did it we didn't do it in the studio we set up a studio inside this little theatre space in Bondi. And, and um, I mean, anything Wayne seems to touch is just brilliant. I mean, I just, I love him as a producer as much as I, you know, admire him as an artist and, and his musical output. Um, working with him at such a young age then into your first foray, how was that for you? 
Yeah, it was good. He, he's a very approachable person. He's very funny. He's got a really good sense of humor. Yeah, so it was, it was pretty. It was pretty easy. It felt very <laughs> familiar. Yeah. Um. So, so moving on. Um, Fear of Girls '96. Um, that record, that record does well, as does Patient. Um, are there any kind of highlight moments, you know, be, between Fear of Girls and Patience and Revenge is Slow that? Um, because at some point you went, you went to America as well, didn't you? Yeah, we went to America in two thousand. And what was that for? Um, we we released Patient, and we were just playing a gig at the Hope Town, and this guy came up and started talking to us, and he was an A and R guy from an American record label that had been sent out here talent scouting, and someone had recommended for him to come and see us and he was just really gushing and they'd never heard us or seen us before and but he was like you know really positive I want to get you to America I want to get you, put put you on our label it was all this sort of stuff I was like oh okay and it happens a lot like where you have not a lot but there's a lot of close calls that you have where you meet people it happened again to Blue Bottle quite a few times different labels are getting contact or just promising the world and so forth but with this guy, six months later, we were out literally in America. They sent us um, plane tickets and stuff, and Millie, our manager, managed to get us a grant and so forth. But, yeah, it was a really strange uh, – I probably don't have time to really go into detail. The short version is that it was when the internet was first taking taking off and this record label was held aloft by shareholders it was like a I don't, Richard would be explaining this better because he's more business savvy but um it was like a floating floating shareholder thing where the whole company was kept aloft by shareholders who were just probably people with too much money that were like oh crazy idea this label that's just existing on the net without being a retail label so they had all this this ridiculous amount of money this label and were just going around and signing bands but I think there was a lot of really dodgy stuff going on with the money uh... And when we arrived, we literally, we bought this van, Richard fitted it out with loft beds and stuff. And we were just sleeping in this guy's, in his backyard, in the van and in his house and stuff. And um, just playing heaps of gigs, but really, really shoddy gigs with like metal bands and stuff like that. And just driving around up and down the West Coast of America, wondering what was going on when the record was coming out and yeah, and the whole company went bust. I think the guy, the head of the company, might have ended up in jail or something. Oh, jeez. And so, yeah, you know, we lived like homeless people for three months, just playing heaps and heaps of weird shows and um, having lots of strange experiences. Just Americans are amazingly hospitable. Like every time we would play a gig, and it's happened since we went back there, people would just offer you. It's a tradition there where someone will go, Have you got somewhere to stay? So you just sleep at a different house every night. It's very rare that you would need. A hotel um but yeah we got to do some recording over there we kind of got talent spotted again a couple of guys that were scouting around for talent in LA saw us play and we ended up working at um this very famous studio oh, Indigo Ranch that the owners passed away recently but like Neil Young some of Neil Young's early albums were recorded there it's this studio in the Malibu Hills and we got to record there for free with these two engineers that were just looking for bands to discover you know so that was that was good. There's lots of weird little experiences like that that happened. Over yeah, there. yeah. And you mentioned strange experiences as well. Was there any that spring to mind? There's more the sort of bands that you would see. Just that what yeah. became really, really obvious being in LA was that whole glam, that sort of scene that had spawned LA Guns and Guns and Roses and even you know Cinderella and Poison and all those sort of bands that that scene was that's where it came from and that was still going because that was very out of vogue in Australia by then but I remember um Richard and Ben and I playing this show and watching uh the band prepare the band we were playing with prepare to go on stage and a guy he had leather pants on <laughs> Well, that's funny in itself yeah and he had a les paul and he and he was getting ready to put his les paul on and we suddenly saw him get a big jar of talcum powder and he and he and he started spraying the talcum powder on the hips of his leather pants and then put his les paul on and then was just practicing swiveling the guitar oh, God. Like on his hips without getting stuck yeah <laughs> that's 
<laughs> Very glam rock. Yeah. <laughs> but we also, and we also, I've told this to people before, but when we were recording at Indigo Ranch, um, the head of the studio said, oh, look, um, it's all fine. It's all good. But um, at lunchtime, you're going to have to take a break for an hour or something because we've got Martin Sheen. Um, he's coming in to do, um, because the Apocalypse Now Redux version, the, uh, the director's cut version with all the extra footage, he's got to come and redo some of his dialogue that was missed in the early 70s when the movie came out that wasn't caught on mic. So right. Re having to redo it, you know. Yeah. So, in other words, yeah, seeing him drive up in his four-wheel drive and then, yeah, he came in and sat and have a lunch with Martin Sheen and was like, I hear you guys are really good. <laughs> That's happened in LA a lot. You just, I mean, you probably know, you just sort of see like all these stars everywhere, famous people that you've seen on TV as a kid your whole life just walking around. Um, How did it end with, with Murmur? Did they just choose not to release records? Did they go through, Um, you know, were they, were they culled in the great, great kind of cull of, of music labels? Did they just want to concentrate on other bands? Um, they kept they kept going for a few more years, I think. But yeah, I was just having a meeting with John one day, and he just sort of dropped it. Oh, I'm sorry, we're going to drop you from the label. It was how was that? How was that at the time to take? It was really hard. Like I uh, personally, I'd sort of I was thinking, how this can't keep going on because yeah, we were seeing bands like Jebediah and Sylvie Kate like get straight mm. up to Triple J whatever and all that sort of stuff and um we weren't getting a lot of airplay and it was taking a long time really to to get any real traction with our music and yeah we were seeing a very quick turnaround with the other bands in the label really gaining commercial traction and ours was really on the slow burn but John loved the band I think we were his little indulgence because he'd signed Silverchair and Ammonia and they'd done really well really quickly and I believe that all the Sony execs were like, they gave him sort of carte blanche on, look, yeah, you like this band, you you you, you sign them, it's fine. You know, he was the golden boy for that in that period. So we, so they signed in good faith based on what, and, and the budgets for us were lower. The understanding was, oh, this band's going to take longer to develop and stuff. But then I think time, after a couple of years, it was, you know, they probably started looking at the checks and balances and were like, what's this band doing on this label? But it was, it was sad because... It was, I think John probably felt really awkward about having to do it. So he didn't really, there was no, <laughs> there was no preparation. It was like, it came out of, I, I thought it might happen, but there was no warning it would. So it was suddenly, I remember just standing on the street outside after this minute going, oh man, we haven't got a record label. It wasn't sort of like, listen, if you don't deliver on this next record or if this doesn't happen, we're going to have to let you go. There was no warning. It was just like, oh. It's just done, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Richard had only been in the band, hadn't been in the band very long. So he joined a band. I think Richard had wanted to join a band that was, seemed like it was going places. <laughs> so how did you navigate that then? Because you didn't give up. I mean, you kept releasing albums. A lot of them came out through shock um, independently. How did you navigate the next course of action for, for Blue Bottle Kiss after that? Yeah, I think we were a bit of an anomaly in that sense because most bands, and there were quite a lot of bands that that happened to where they put out a couple of EPs, they didn't stick, they'd be on a big label and it's like, where do you go after that? Mm. Most people you just split up. That's what's expected. And we actually felt that from the music industry. There was a real, uh, like, it was really difficult to find someone that would that would uh, allow us to, that would license um, anything from us like it was like we were kind of lepers for a little while but I mean we had a couple of things in our favor we just signed to a it was our first decent booking agency which was Joe Joe Sig's IMC and he was extremely very lovely man and really helpful and I know I just personally got along with him straight away and he kind of got we went straight from being dropped to actually getting better shows so that really helped and um we just kept playing, playing. And by that stage, with Richard and Ben and me, we'd become quite a force live. Like we'd played together a lot and we'd finally gelled as a live unit. So we were touring a lot and we just seemed to start getting more fans. And Triple J seemed to around that time, it's like they sort of went, Oh, actually this band's pretty good and started um they started 
they started actually playing us where they never gave us airplay, hardly any airplay when we were on a major label. Um, they were kind of like pushing back on us all the time, which was probably one of the reasons we got dropped is we couldn't get airplay, but they they came on board as well. So it was it was weird. Uh, we were actually, be, whatever our peak popularity period was, it was definitely not when we were on a larger label. It was when we were on a, releasing stuff on independent labels. And with the love that's going on right now in the Sound as Ever group and, and the 90s really being celebrated, um, do you feel that the appreciation for Blue Bottle Kiss has increased ex exponentially since since perhaps the 93-07 period? I do think the band's, I think the band's music has aged well. And I think some people, other people probably can hear that as well. I don't think it's dated too much. I don't think it has dated at all. Yeah. So yeah. I think that helps. Some of the really popular stuff from that period, um, the alternative rock sort of music from that period, maybe with the production and other stuff, some of it probably has. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it felt like with Blue Bottle that we got more critically accepted as time went on. And by that, by our late period, we seemed to have a real purple patch with music critics. So that helped. But yeah, since then, I don't know. I don't, it's, I, I can't, you know, <laughs> the only thing you see is comments on social media, people saying how much they love this record or whatever. I don't really know how far the reach is. It's nice when you get messages from people and you hear, you hear, you know, it's a bit of a message in the bottle thing. Mm. You, think you chuck it out there and you don't know where it ends up. So it's hard for me to track and probably not too healthy to pay too much attention to it anyway, you know. Now, from memory, your last gig as Blue Bottle Kiss was a benefit show for Jared at the Hoey. I could be wrong, though, but that was when Ben played with BBK for the first time in about five years. Was it ever determined whether it was going to be a breakup or a on hiatus uh, kind of moment from that, that last gig? Yeah, well, we'd sort of officially, well, it wasn't even official. We did two nights at the factory in 07, with the last lineup of Blue Bottle Kiss, which um, which was the post Ben Fletch um lineup, because he left in two thousand and four, I think. Um, so we did Doubt Seeds um with a different lineup, um, which was Groundsy, Jared, Ross, and me. Um, and then yeah, that benefit was it was Ross. It was, the benefit was actually for Ross, our bass player, oh. got really really ill, so. Bam wasn't really active at that stage and and Groundsy was living in Melbourne so Fletch kind of stepped back to his old role and uh, role and we um yeah we just played together a few songs and and that was it so that show wasn't really a yeah the band had already ended at that stage it was just kind of like oh we'll just get up and play for four or five songs we didn't really we didn't rehearse or anything we just sort of um I think Fletch and I had a I went over to his house and we just had a quick run through and yeah and just played so that was, yeah, that was just a weird sort of thing, uh, more of a informal sort of thing. So you've you've um, kind of enjoyed being a solo artist, I imagine. Um, does that does that work better for you being 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 a solo artist, being in control, you know, uh, as opposed to working with a band, or or is it much of a muchness for you? You just love playing music. What works better? Well. Really, over the past fifteen years or whatever, um, I've done a bit of everything. Like so, the solo records, uh, yeah, I've put out I don't know how many, maybe four or five solo records. But also, um, I do have a band, Infinity Broke, which is a quartet, um, which I have with my brother, and and Ruben on bass, and and Jared has come in and out of that band as well. So. And I've also done a record with Peter Fenton from Crow. We did our collaboration, The Tall Grass. There's been a bunch of stuff. So what I've enjoyed about the post Blue Bottle Kiss period is being a bit of a free agent. So being quite collaborative with other people or being really, you know, doing everything myself. I, I do sort of love it all. It's like playing solo shows. I really enjoy just playing with just on my own or I love playing in a noisy rock band as well. Every element whether it's collaborating or doing things totally your own way. You don't really, uh, the best situation is being able to do all of them sort of 
in different periods because they're all really enjoyable. What song are you most looking forward to playing on this particular tour? What what what's one that you just you're like, yes, when it comes up on the set list, you're like, yeah, can't wait to play this one. Um I do like playing the noisy ones. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like I love just that, just hearing like that bottom end come through the stage. Like Six Wheels is the song that's fun to play off Patient. Um, um, yeah, anything that you can really immerse yourself in. We have a lot of concise songs as well, which, which you know, we're really proud of and and I really enjoy. Um, and that's more of a, it's almost like you're not really playing it's song, almost like you're in the audience just enjoying the song because it's not so much of a journey. But yeah, and you need those to have a bit of a breather. But I do, I do really like all the really immersive ones, the ones that kind of go off in tangents and stuff. Like um, "Boarding You're Breaking My Heart," that's we've been mucking around with that, which is which gets quite free form at the end. Those kind of things, that have maybe slight elements of improvisation and stuff, are really really fun in a live context for everyone to play. Well, speaking of the live context, we look forward to seeing you live. Uh, you kick off in Adelaide and uh, make your way uh, through to Melbourne, uh, Brisbane, Sydney and Perth. So enjoy it. The, the kind of the Blue Bottle Kiss, um, it's not a reunion as such. Can we call it a reunion? It's kind of like just the band are back together-ish. Yeah, I yeah, well, there's there's quite a few different lineups, so it's this this particular lineup this, playing this, together. Yeah, this this particular lineup. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it is. I mean, we haven't we haven't actually played a show for under the Blue Bottle Kiss name for over fifteen years, so I guess it'd be fair to call it a reunion. But it does <laughs> it does always smell that um that term? But yeah, I don't know. It is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's just it's just the blokes from Blue Bottle Kiss are getting together. Yeah. That, and making yeah. some noise. Yeah. Great to catch up with you, Jamie. Thanks for your time. Thanks, everyone.